Hi, my name is Ben Herbstman. I'm a psychiatrist affiliated with McLean. Um, I am here to uh, uh, first thank you all for coming today. Uh, and to let you know, this is the 16th annual Adam Cornell Major Teachers in Psychotherapy Lecture. Um, many of you have likely heard Glenn Glass, who uh, asked that we not make too much of a fuss, but we can't help ourselves, um, uh, because he's made the opening remarks for this event and been uh, in charge of it, uh, uh, I believe, since its inception. Um, and he has uh, stewarded it uh, quite well. And, and uh, now Richard Schwartz, uh, who's in the front row and will make the introductions to our speaker, and I are uh, inheriting this role in, uh, moving forward. Um, so thank you, Len, and sorry that I didn't listen to you, sort of. Um, so we're, we're honored also to recognize Marty Cornell and her da daughter, Kathy Stromland, uh, who unfortunately could not be here today. Uh, it was Marty and her husband, Fred, a former member of McLean's Board of Trustees, who created this annual lecture in honor of their son Ad uh, and Katie's brother, Adam. The Cornell's goal of making this gift to McLean was to help the staff expand its knowledge of psychotherapy and all the benefits it can offer our patients. This year, we're excited to welcome Dr. Carrie Solkowitz as our 2017 Adam Cornell speaker and major teacher of psychotherapy, because we believe he will continue in this tradition of expanding our knowledge of psychodynamic thought. Dr. Solkowitz has done something that our field has sometimes had some difficulty doing, which is taking psychoanalytic and psychodynamic ideas outside the hospital and consulting room and into organizations, businesses, boardrooms, and the lay press. Teaching these concepts is essential for the public to be informed about leadership and group dynamics, uh, something increasingly important in today's increasingly politicized landscape. We're thrilled to hear about Dr. Sokowitz's experiences uh, today, and now I will ask Dr. Schwartz to introduce Dr. Sokowitz. Uh, so, uh, Carrie Solkowitz serves as a trusted advisor to some of the world's most uh, well-known CEOs and corporate boards. He founded and is the managing principal of the Boswell Group, which is a New York-based consulting group. He's trained as a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst. Um, and he advises on a range of issues, including leadership challenges, CEO succession, management and boardroom dynamics, and corporate culture. <clears throat> Carrie's also a senior advisor to Hydric and Struggles, a global executive search firm. Uh, he's often cited in the press in articles about the psychology of business, uh, including the Wall Street Journal, uh, Financial Times, New York Times, Washington Post, and was a regular columnist in, for Business Week and Fast Company magazines. His article, Worse Than Enemies, The CEO's Destructive Confidant, was published in the Harvard Business Review in 2004. Um, uh, Kerry uh, uh, grew up in Texas, came uh, east for uh, uh, college at Harvard College, uh, went back to Texas uh, for medical school at the University of Texas Medical Branch, and then uh, back east again for uh, his psychiatry residency at NYU in Bellevue. Uh, where he uh, remains uh, at, uh, now as a clinical professor of psychiatry. Uh, and he has also uh, won the Distinguished Teacher Award there. Uh, he's also received the Edith Sabshin Teaching Award from the American Psychoanalytic Association. Um, and finally, he's a passionate uh, human rights advocate and is chair of the uh, board of the Physicians for Human Rights. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Kerry Selkowitz. Thank you so much for the, uh, the kindness of introductions. It's uh, really an honor for me to be here uh, with you today. And uh, thank you to the Cornell family. I'm sorry they're not able to be here today. Thanks to the, to the faculty and the residents and the staff uh, at McLean. I just had the opportunity to meet with a group of residents just before this. And uh, it was certainly a lot of fun for me and great talking with them. It's a treat also to be uh, back in Harvard country, which feels like a comforting home in these strange and perilous times that we live in. When I was growing up as a child of Holocaust survivors, I remember being intensely curious about leaders. 
It wasn't an intellectual or professional interest back then. It was purely emotional. I couldn't keep my hands off biographies and autobiographies of political figures, successful entrepreneurs, coaches of famous football teams, and CEOs. How, I wondered, did leaders get large groups of people to do good things, and especially, how did they get them to do bad things? What was it about them? People like Churchill and FDR and Martin Luther King Jr. and Hitler that made others want to follow them. I was riveted by their stories, which had personal meaning for me that I wouldn't discover until years later when I was in psychoanalysis and beyond. It may seem obvious to you hearing this now, but the determinants of my interest in leadership, passionate as it was, remained obscure to me even as I was drawn to leadership roles myself in virtually every organization that I belonged to. I would get emotional in the face of inspiring leadership and angry when I saw bad leaders exploiting their roles, mistreating their followers, or squandering the chance to improve the lot of their people. If Hitler hadn't led the Nazis to murder most of my parents' families, with my parents themselves somehow managing to survive the ghettos and camps and come to America as immigrants, then of course I wouldn't be here giving this talk today. One way to work out such childhood mysteries was to make a career out of it. And that, in short, is what I've done. I wish I could tell you that I had a brilliant plan for becoming an advisor to CEOs and boards, but the truth is that I stumbled into it and figured things out by the seat of my pants. Within a few years of graduating from my residency and analytic training, I had a full-time clinical practice and a teaching position at NYU. I loved helping people and I loved the intellectual underpinnings of psychoanalysis, but in a moment of honesty with myself, in the middle of a long day of private practice, I realized that I was feeling too constrained by the routine of seeing one patient after another in my quiet, softly lit office on the Upper East Side of New York. I was too restless for that. And my most fun professional hour of the week was when I trekked down to NYU Medical Center to teach residents at Bellevue, or later when I was speaking to the press in my role as chair of the Public Information Committee of the American Psychoanalytic Association. It dawned on me, anxiously that day, that I didn't want to be in private practice for the rest of my career, but I had no idea what to do with that realization until some years later I was attending a cocktail party with my wife, who was also a psychiatrist and an analyst. As you undoubtedly know, one of the occupational hazards of being a shrink is that when people find out what we do, especially at cocktail parties and especially after they've had a few drinks, they sometimes decide to unburden themselves. I rather like that because I like hearing people's stories. The person that I was talking to started telling me about how he and two friends had left a big company and founded an internet startup in New York. This was in late 1995, the early years of the internet. But now he was having some trouble. Since he had become the CEO and his two friends hadn't, the dynamics of their relationship had changed and there were conflicts among the partners. They'd also gotten seed funding from a Japanese company, and there were some tensions between their Japanese investors and the, run, the young Americans who were running the business. And since my acquaintance had never been a CEO before, he was struggling to figure out how to inhabit the role. He was refreshingly open and thoughtful, but clearly looking for some answers. I thought it was just an interesting cocktail party conversation until he said, I think it was after the second glass of red, so, Kerry, when would you be able to start advising me in my business? I told him that I thought he was out of his mind and said he obviously needed help. I said he probably should hire somebody who did that for a living. He laughed and he said that he appreciated my bluntness. He told me that he'd found it helpful to talk since he had nobody he could open up to at the office and that I sounded like I was interested in business. I replied that he seemed like a nice guy and that I'd certainly be happy to get together with him for lunch from time to time. He asked me how much I'd charge for that sort of consultation. And I replied, look, I don't have the slightest idea. Why don't you supply the sandwiches and we'll call it a deal? He laughed again and he said, you're obviously a terrible business person, <laughs> but if this works out, we can renegotiate. It was a conversation that changed my life 
That was how I got started at that cocktail party, and I've continued to be extremely lucky ever since. I worked with him, and he was nice enough to refer me to a couple of other CEOs of startups. And then, after working with a grand total of five, I did what any self-respecting academic does. I declared myself an expert and wrote a paper about it. The paper wound up getting published on the cover of an internet industry magazine in the late 90s. The paper was called Psychoanalysis and the New Economy. And then the New York Times did this profile of me that was a complete puff piece with the headline, Executives Line Up for Couch Treatment. That wasn't exactly what I was offering, but it was apparently intriguing enough for me to start getting calls from other CEOs wanting to talk about their businesses. Before long, I had a largely undeserved reputation for knowing something about the psychology of CEOs. After a few years of cramming these projects into the nooks and crannies of my private practice, I faced what felt like an existential crisis, at least a professional one. Whether to close my clinical practice entirely and see if I could develop a full-time consulting practice. It felt scary, to tell you the truth, but my wife was supportive and so was my second analyst, and I've never looked back. So to fast forward to the present, let me briefly describe my consulting practice today before we get into talking about leadership more generally, just to put this into some context. There are three parts to the practice, all interrelated. The core of it, in about two-thirds of my time, is in what I refer to as a CEO advisory practice, which is essentially what I started doing at that cocktail party more than 20 years ago. It's about serving as an advisor, a confidant, really, to CEOs and their management teams and boards, focusing on people and culture and their own challenges as leaders. Most of my clients now are the CEOs and boards of large public companies, along with some privately held family-controlled businesses. The scale has changed over the years, but it's not that different from what I started doing at the cocktail party. I love this work because it allows me to bring a clinical perspective to bear on whatever is on my clients' minds, and in turn, enabling them to think more psychologically about their work and their lives in general. It also allows me to continue learning about aspects of the world that I wouldn't otherwise have any exposure to. For some of the CEOs that I work with, it's the closest that they will ever get to seeing a therapist. And while they're not my patients, there's no question that there can be a therapeutic aspect to these advisory relationships, which often continue for the duration of the CEO's tenure. Several of my clients are now well past the decade mark. It's also rare for CEOs to be in office for that long. The second part of the practice is more project-focused and involves advising boards on CEO succession. This tends to be in a few kinds of situations. Transitions in founder-led organizations to the next generation of leadership, generational transitions in family-controlled businesses, and the last category, which would probably best be described as complicated and messy, such as advising the board of a governmental organization that was at the eye of the storm during the financial crisis. The third part of my practice is another variation on the theme of leaders and is an investor practice focused mainly on evaluating CEOs and senior teams and companies that are under consideration for acquisition or investment by private equity firms. Before I move on to talk about leadership more specifically, I just want to mention one other part of my life that my work in business has allowed me to get involved in, and that's the human rights world. Richard alluded to this. I currently have the privilege of serving as the chair of the board of directors of Physicians for Human Rights, which is a wonderful organization that shared in the Nobel Peace Prize long before my involvement back in 1997 for its role in the international campaign to ban landmines. As some of you know, uh, PHR was founded in 1986 by a group of doctors at Harvard Medical School. And for many years, our headquarters was based down the street in Cambridge before we moved to New York a few years ago. I would urge all of you, especially in these alarming times, to consider joining PHR's efforts to investigate and document human rights abuses abroad and at home and advocate on behalf of the victims. I'm passionate about this work, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also because it speaks to the values of medicine and science, and I would add leadership, that led many of us to choose these careers in the first place. Okay, so what does all this have to do with leadership? Well, I would say quite a bit. What, what is leadership anyway? There are many definitions, and all it takes is a quick stroll through the business section of your local Barnes & Noble 
or the Amazon equivalent, to see shelves of books on the subject. They're written by a diverse group of experts, and they range, in my view, from the very good to the very bad. Some, like Peter Drucker, Edgar Schein, Ron Heifetz, Ken Isold, Otto Kernberg, and Fred Ketz de Vries, Abraham Zelesnik, are wonderful and deeper thinkers psychologically. Others, who I won't name, tend to fall into a few categories. There are the retired successful CEOs and political leaders who write essentially autobiographical accounts of how to be great leaders, but they seem to miss the point that what worked for them emanates from their personalities and the unique contexts of their experiences and doesn't necessarily apply to anyone else. Then there are the, shall we say, more superficial self-appointed gurus, sometimes with virtually no qualifications other than tremendous self-confidence, who tend to be more the inspirational speaker variety who offer X number of steps to becoming a better leader. These formulaic books, which I might add sell like hotcakes in airport bookstores, always aim to be prescriptive and they drive me crazy because there is nothing about leadership that lends itself to the five easy steps to being a better leader approach. But their appeal to the masses, to those who aspire to or fantasize about being a leader, is obvious. In this talk, I can't possibly try to cover the vast field of leadership, so my observations today are necessarily drawn from my having been an advisor to and a student of really about 100 business leaders over the past two decades. Let me try to offer my own definition of leadership, which isn't entirely original and has elements drawn from other thinkers on the topic, some of whom I just mentioned. Perhaps my favorite definition of leadership is the simplest one and may at first blush sound circular. It defines leadership in terms of its aim, and that's to say that the goal of leadership is to inspire followership. Think about that. I like this definition because of two things. It includes the word inspire, which is an inherently emotional phenomenon rather than purely rational behavior, and it explicitly evokes the critical idea of a relationship between the leader and the led. It's akin to D.W. Winnicott's famously provocative line about how, quote, there is no such thing as a baby. There is a baby and someone, most often the mother. There is no such thing as a leader without followers. And the leader can't be understood in isolation from the system created by those followers. The best leaders, in my experience, do two essential things. They define reality for their followers, and they give them hope. You can't have one without the other. If leaders only give hope without adequately defining reality, they can lead their followers dangerously astray. This happens when leaders are out of touch or create a highly distorted version of reality, which plays into their followers' wish to avoid some difficult aspects of their own circumstances. And if leaders only define reality without giving hope, they come across as uninspiring, wonkish, and depressing. Leadership is personal. This is why the leadership gurus who give you five steps to being a better one are charlatans. Because leadership emanates directly from the personality and values of the individual leader. Having a leadership role doesn't make one a leader. It's how one inhabits the role, how one acts in relation to followers that is the essence of leadership. And leadership is contextual. Contrary, again, to the formulations of leadership books, leadership is not always portable. A good leader in one situation may be an awful leader in another. Rudy Giuliani was seen as an effective and even heroic mayor of New York City in the aftermath of 9-11. Since losing his followers, he has become, at least in my view, one of the most misanthropic, morally bankrupt public figures. Similar things could be said about the diminished effectiveness of Winston Churchill after the Second World War. For me, the highest form of leadership is moral leadership, which is leadership with a profound values-based core. Hitler, it could be argued, was a compelling leader who mobilized many followers on a mission of fear, hatred, and murder. But he was amoral. Martin Luther King, Jr., on the other hand, inspired countless people in the continuing quest 
for civil rights and social justice and had a profound moral core. Given our new leadership in Washington, it's hard to resist saying something about presidential leadership. There have been many effective American presidents whose leadership styles and approaches to the use of power varied widely. There's also a truth to Lord Acton's famous dictum that, quote, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But Robert Caro, the great biographer of another American president, Lyndon Johnson, offered this wise observation about power that I find even more psychologically astute. Caro said, although the cliche says that power always corrupts, what is seldom said is that power always reveals. Presidential power does not grant presidential impunity. The use of presidential power informed by empathy, fairness, and justice is on the road to moral leadership. The abuse of presidential power constitutes tyranny. One of the most powerful and smartest behaviors on the part of any American president is the power that comes with judgment and restraint. Just because he, and alas it always has been a he, can do what he wants doesn't mean that he should do anything he wants. How presidents treat those who are less fortunate and those with whom he disagrees and those who are different in every possible meaning of that word is the moral measure of a leader. In my work as a confidant to a diverse set of leaders over the past two decades, I'm often asked, what is the most dangerous trait in leaders? Frankly, there are many. Not having a moral core that informs all their thoughts and behaviors is at the top of my list. Being impulsive is another. Making decisions too quickly without the benefit of enough reliable information or without thinking through the potential for long-term unintended consequences can be catastrophic for a business leader or a world leader. Sometimes the best thing for a leader to do in what seems like an urgent situation is absolutely nothing save for collecting one's thoughts, gathering the best possible advice, sleeping on it, and then being able to take more informed action. Impulsivity in a president, of all people, is terrifying. There's one more element that I'd like to mention in this woefully incomplete list of dangerous leader, leadership behaviors, and that's what I refer to as pathological certainty. Pathological certainty refers to the belief that one is always right. I'm not talking about self-confidence or a healthy ego in the colloquial sense of that term, both of which are important for effective leadership, but a modicum of self-doubt and humility, of a willingness to admit when one is wrong or to apologize when one has harmed another, and an openness to taking advice from others with differing points of view. This measure of vulnerability takes real strength and is what makes a leader great. All of us in the human rights world, along with everyone else, are watching our president closely, as we've watched all presidents, to see what his power reveals about his character. This is our role, and we're looking, among other things, for moral leadership. So far, I've seen no evidence of it. One of the most common questions that comes up is whether leadership can be taught or Put differently, are leaders born or created? <clears throat> One's style of leadership doesn't fundamentally get formed at Harvard Business School, although there's a lot to be learned there. It's worth noting that an entire multi-billion dollar industry, the leadership development industry, is based on the assumption that leadership can indeed be taught. A psychodynamic perspective leads me to see much of that industry as downright fraudulent, in that it is naive, dangerous, and wasteful to think that anyone can, beco can become or should become a leader. Our society increasingly valorizes and ultimately cheapens the notion of real leadership. And one consequence of this is to think that leadership represents some higher sort of being, which is not true. Our culture has sold the public on the belief that we should all be leaders. What we need, if anything, is a few great leaders, far more great managers, and much better followership. When followership is equated in the public consciousness with passivity or submission, 
we do ourselves a disservice. But to return to the question of where does leadership come from, I would suggest a third possibility, which is that most leaders are neither born nor created, but in fact they are crucially molded into future leaders by early life experience. Leadership, I believe, is formed in the same crucible of life experience and genetic endowments that shape us generally. Leadership, like I said, is very personal. This is a psychoanalytic position to view leadership as a complex developmental process. That's not to say that as advisors to or therapists to leaders, we can't help them grow and be better. But in my experience of having served now as an advisor to a diverse group of CEOs and political leaders, the very best of them have a few dynamic factors in common. Although any generalization that I make runs the risk of being taken too literally. What I have seen repeatedly, however, is that early parental loss, followed by the particular adaptation of stepping precociously into a parent-like role, is a common element in the later development of entrepreneurial leadership personalities. These losses can include parental death, divorce, emotional unavailability due to mental or physical illness. Of course, most people who experience this sort of childhood trauma don't compensate for it by becoming entrepreneurs or CEOs. Most respond by developing a range of emotional problems. But many great leaders do have this kind of experience in their history. And naturally, with the adaptations come vulnerabilities as well. So much for the glamorization of leadership. What are the vulnerabilities that attend leadership? Probably the most fundamental and ubiquitous one is isolation. The old saying that it's lonely at the top is absolutely true. And if I'm being honest, it's probably that fact alone that keeps people like me in business. Leaders at the top of all organizations are inherently insulated as the dynamics of power inhibit the upward flow of information and candid communication in particular. The dynamics of power also interferes with the freedom that leaders might otherwise feel about being forthright and vulnerable themselves. Of course, they may have other reasons and fears about opening up, but the role itself, and this is the critical point, the role changes everything. Leaders are also vulnerable to the overvaluing of their own thinking and live in what can become a positive feedback loop that makes it increasingly difficult for them to test reality and the soundness of their own ideas. Not surprisingly, intense anxiety is common, ranging from their various personal insecurities, which they may try to keep hidden, to the expectable strains of inhabiting a role in which they constantly encounter uncertainty and ambiguity. There is very little that is routine and predictable about a day in the life of a CEO. <clears throat> Overconfidence can, at times, veer toward grandiosity. And I've seen a few CEOs over the years, particularly entrepreneurial founders of remarkable startups who have been hypomanic and occasionally manic. <clears throat> Depression, of course, may not be far behind. Individual and group dynamic insights into the emotional experience of leadership can shed light on why some leaders fail and even why entire organizations fail. Like with anything else I'm discussing, there are no formulas for either success or failure. There are always external factors that one might argue aren't entirely the leader's responsibility, like a fundamentally flawed business model or organizational mission or such extreme pressures in the external economic environment that makes success impossible. Perhaps even more common are failures of governance. Everybody has a boss and boards of directors are ultimately responsible for hiring, evaluating, and firing, if necessary, the leader. Boards are ultimately responsible for approving the strategic direction of an organization. I suppose where I land on the spectrum of assigning blame for failure, namely, uh, emanates directly from what I consider to be a particularly psychoanalytic set of values, namely the belief that while bad things are always happening to us and to our organizations, we all as adults must accept personal responsibility for them. Put differently, I try to help leaders start with the default assumption that it's my fault or at least be open to their contribution to the problem. 
This perspective is the opposite of the pathological certainty perspective that I was speaking about earlier. Leaders fail for many reasons of their own, usually having to do with their not making themselves vulnerable enough to establish the interpersonal connectedness that has so much to do with leadership effectiveness. Other common failings include not acting quickly enough on people problems in their organizations, not paying enough attention to creating an organizational culture that supports, reinforces the right behaviors in their people, and not having a sound enough strategy for the organization that can then be communicated clearly to inspire everyone else. The best leaders are innately passionate, driven, resilient, creative, and self-aware. The ideal leader does not exist. I'd like to say a few words about leadership in relation to organizational culture. Corporate culture has for years been one of the hottest topics in the business press. Articles glowingly describe what it's like to work at some companies and how horrible it is at others. Culture has been implicated in the fall of Enron, the abusiveness of Uber, and the success of Apple but it's an extremely nebulous concept, even though we all know it when we see it. What is organizational culture and how can we understand it through a clinical lens? I'd like to use an analogy that isn't perfect to offer my views on the connection between leadership and culture. It's where the analogy breaks down that it gets more interesting. Start with the concept of personality, something that we're all familiar with. Personality is a complex set of behaviors, traits, values that come together for each of us in a unique way. The durability of personality traits over time is one of the hallmarks of the idea. And we're taught as psychiatry residents the difference between personality and mood. I can be having a good day or a bad day, but my personality is consistent over time and easily recognizable. Personality, for better or worse, makes each of us knowable. There's also an internal and external component to personality. The internal refers to what it's like to be someone, how I experience myself on the inside, while the external refers to what it's like to be with me, to interact with me as a friend, a colleague, a parent, etc. We also know where to locate personality. It's the product of biology, environment, and accumulated life experience, and it resides in my mind, in my brain. Now for the analogy, which is a bit of a stretch. I'd like to suggest that the culture of an organization is analogous to the personality of an individual. It's a set of norms, of ways of treating others and solving problems, and of values. Culture is also durable and distinctive, with an internal and external component, too. The internal part refers to what it's like to work somewhere, to live inside a particular organization. And the external refers to what it's like to interact with the organization from the outside. In a hospital, for instance, what's it like to be a patient, a family member, an outside funder of research, a vendor, the competition, etc.? You get my point. But where the analogy between the personality of an individual and the culture of an organization breaks down is when you try to answer the question of where is culture located? Unlike the personality of an individual, culture is embedded in lots of places, in the people, the practices, the policies, the physical plant, the history of the organization, with all that added complexity, we can then return to the question of how organizational culture develops and how can it be influenced. And that brings us full circle back to the leader. In founder-led organizations, where this may be easiest to see, culture emanates directly from the personality of the founder, in my experience, and it often persists long after the founder is gone. The culture is often a direct expression of the behaviors and values of the leader. And I would argue that to an important degree, this is true in all organizations. It starts at the top. And clearly the greatest single point of leverage if one is trying to effect change in an organizational culture is with the CEO, the leader. The CEO is always under the electron microscope and in Part, and part of that scrutiny is both a conscious and unconscious observation of behavior that is then identified with and emulated throughout the organization. This can be a force for good if the leader is ethical, hardworking, creative, and a force for bad if the leader is corrupt or biased, to use but a few examples. 
I never cease to be amazed at how prof profound the influence of a leader's character is on the culture of organizations. And this applies not only to corporations, but to countries as well. Can leaders change? Well, leaders are people, and all of you in this room are in the business of helping people change in one way or another, so you know how hard it is. My answer is yes, we can help leaders be better, but we also have to be coldly realistic about the limits of our therapeutic and advisory zeal. We can help leaders overcome obstacles to become more open or to taking greater risk or to freeing up some inhibited creativity. But in the same way that we can't help someone be taller, we can't fundamentally change character. This notion of the limits to our work leads me to touch on yet another topic, and that is the notion of applied psychoanalysis. When I was in analytic training in the late 80s, we had a course in applied psychoanalysis in our final year. Then, the application of a dynamic perspective was primarily in the realm of dead people incorporating psychoanalysis into literary criticism, for example, which added intellectual rigor and emotional depth to an understanding of great works of art or film. I think that activity is wonderful, but it's, it's not what I do. Instead, I try to take a dynamic perspective and broaden it in a few ways. First, I'm taking it out of the consulting room and into the workplace, meeting with my clients, not my patients, in their offices, homes, over meals, getting to know not only the leaders, but the people in their lives, their teams, their boards, their families. The boundaries of this kind of work are markedly different than what most psychiatrists and psychoanalysts are accustomed to or comfortable with in their clinical practices. Although there are certainly mental health professionals who work with families, consult to schools, and otherwise get out of their offices and immerse themselves in various systems. In fact, it is the systems perspective that I had to learn on my own. It was taught only superficially in my residency uh, as part of our training in family and group therapy, and it wasn't addressed at all in my analytic institute. I'm also trying to push for the expansion of psychoanalysis from a largely therapeutic helping tool to include one that is more purely evaluative and coldly realistic about the complexity and fixity of personality and behavior. One of the many strands that led me to develop my own rather idiosyncratic brand of applied psychoanalysis was a reaction against the psychoanalytic orthodoxy of my training. And in particular, what I initially thought was reducible to a mismatch between the abstinent striving for analytic neutrality and my own temperament. Being rather shy and introverted, but wanting to be more sociable and outgoing, I didn't always know if I was struggling against my own inhibitions or against the external rules. No doubt it was a combination of both. But as I came to feel freer about being more open and vulnerable, in part thanks to a personal analysis, I found that it was not only more helpful to my clients and to my patients during my career transition from clinical work to consulting, but it was also liberating personally. Finally, I'd like to say a little bit about the question of why psychoanalysis and psychiatry have had relatively little to say about leadership and offer some reflections on the field from the perspective of somebody who's had a non-traditional career. On the surface, it is surprising that there is relatively so little in the clinical literature given how clearly psychological many of these phenomena are. I think there are several factors at play. One is that psychoanalysis, and perhaps psychiatry even more so, is naturally focused on the diagnosis and treatment of psychopathology, of illness. We're trained to look for problems, for symptoms, for something that we can help with, rather than looking at naturally occurring behaviors that need to be appreciated and enhanced, or shaped by manipulating the environment instead of altering the behaviors directly. In a class that I teach fourth year psychiatry residents at NYU called The Psychodynamics of Leadership and Organizations, this is one of the most important things that I try to help my residents unlearn. When analysts talk about a leader, their reflex is often to first see narcissism or unalloyed aggression rather than charisma, drive, and imagination. Occasionally, when members of management teams that I advise are in individual therapy, their therapists can actually make matters worse by having so little understanding of their patients' roles in the larger organizational dynamics, 
and instead limit themselves to quasi-interpretive exhortations to see their relationship with their boss, for instance, in Oedipal terms. In effect, saying things like, don't take that from him, be a man, fight for yourself. And these interventions can turn out to be destructive to their patients' careers and even to the organizations as a whole. Well-intentioned yet misguided therapy can make business situations worse by misunderstanding the role of the leader and offering poor advice even when couched in the form of an interpretation. But there are deeper reasons why psychoanalysis has largely neglected leadership, and I would argue that one of them is the field's own highly conflicted relationship to authority. There is a well-known phenomenon in the business world called Founder's Syndrome, which refers to the common situation that occurs in organizations led by a founder who doesn't want to let go or to turn over the reins to the next generation of leader against all rational arguments for doing so. Some founders, by dint of their narcissism, don't feel that anyone can possibly replace them. Occasionally they may be right. And some unconsciously choose successors who they intuitively know will fail, thus proving that they were right and irreplaceable. Organizations and social movements can have their own version of founder syndrome in that, they in that they collude with the founder's fantasy that no one can fill their shoes and they never mourn his or her loss. I would suggest that the field of psychoanalysis is still struggling with its ambivalent attachment to Freud and since him has never really had the kind of leadership it needs to adapt and thrive in modern society. We can also see manifestations of this institutionalized blind spot about leadership in the bureaucratic stifling ways that some of our psychoanalytic institutions are governed and in the retrogressive conservatism of the training analyst system and the interminable fights about other substantive issues which require strong leadership to resolve. In any event, while clinical work will, in my view, always remain at the center of what mental health professionals do, I think that ensuring the future of the field will depend increasingly on leaders who can steer the professions through turbulent waters and chart an aspirational interdisciplinary course for an evolving set of ideas. And I think there will be a need for more widespread application of psychodynamic thinking in a diverse range of settings. There will be many obstacles along the way, and you're undoubtedly familiar with them all, but the one I worry about the most is our internal resistance to change. I hope I've made a reasonably convincing argument that the mental health professions and the psychodynamic perspective in particular have a lot to offer leaders and their organizations. I would encourage you to think about how you can help leaders and how you can be leaders. We've never needed good leadership more than we do today. Thank you. Time for some, a yeah. little bit of questions. Happy to answer any questions or talk about anything. Paul. And so our live stream people can hear. Uh, my name is Paul Buttonweiser. I'm interested uh, in, in a concept that you didn't address by name, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about it, which is charisma. You know, it, it, charisma is something that I talk about with leaders. Charisma is not something that you learn, you know, at the at the business school. It's a it's a set of it's a complex set of personality traits. Um, the, the and I'm reluctant when I talk about it, particularly when I talk about it with a non-clinical audience, um, to to talk about the the narcissistic aspects of charisma. Bec precisely because of what I was trying to say earlier about not wanting to pathologize it, because as soon as you use a word like narcissism, it, it starts to do just that. Um, but charisma, um, and, I, and one of the things I've learned, by the way, slight digression, if I may, for, from your question, is, um, is to try to, to use as little clinical lingo as possible, in my, particularly when I'm out there in the world uh, not dealing with, with uh, an audience of clinicians for that reason. Um, charisma has to do with a kind of likability, a kind of magnetism, a kind of draw, a kind of interpersonal relatedness, 
Um, there's a, there, I, th I think if you want to dive deeper into it, there's, a, I think, an object relations kind of pers perspective gets into charisma because it automatically gets you into the, the two-person field. Uh, the charisma doesn't occur in a vacuum, but it's an attractor. And, uh, and it's an important part, um, even if we leave it, leave it a little bit nebulous, it's an important part of what these entrepreneurial successful uh, leaders do. And the best leaders are the entrepreneurial ones. Um, because they have to, to get people to follow them, and charisma is part of it. There's this kind of likability. Uh, it, it was part of what I think uh, we, we saw some of, or some might argue an absence of, in one of our candidates uh, in the recent presidential election. So, but, it, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very important thing that is, uh, it, it's, most, most people either have it or they don't. It's something that's hard to develop. Uh, in the back. Um, that one first, and then here next. I was just wondering how your work is similar or different to the new field of executive coaching. Yeah, uh, I met with the residents just before this, and we were talking about that. Um, try to answer that briefly. Um, uh, I, I, I assume most people in the room are at least familiar with the term executive coaching. It's, it's certainly in the business world. It's, a, it's widely known, and, and it's an enormous industry. It's a, it, it started prob probably about 20 years ago and, um, and is, is now a, a, an enormous industry, largely uh, filled with individual practitioners, although there are some firms that offer executive coaching. Executive coaching is... Um, it grows out of, in some ways, a destigmatization of the need for people who work inside these large organ organizations, particularly in senior roles, to have somebody to talk to and to help them with some of their, uh, what is referred to sort of quaintly as their soft skills, their people skills. Um, but these days, um, the, the explosion of executive coaching is such that there's a coach for everything, and there are even life coaches, which kind of covers the, the map. Um, everything sort of falls under the heading of life. Um, it's a, it is a generic term, executive coaching, in that uh, there is no specific training for it. There are some people who call themselves executive coaches who have clinical backgrounds, psychiatry, psychology, whatever. Uh, there are others who are retired business executives who do it uh, you know, as something to do as kind of a mentoring sort of experience after they've retired. There are you know, um, um, people who are sports coaches who think that their 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 you know skills as a sports you know basketball coach can translate into the boardroom. Um, I, I don't like the term uh, partly because it's so generic and and and, and ill-defined. <clears throat> I, I'm quite happy to call myself a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst, but I think another reason why I think it's actually a potentially dangerous phenomenon, although there's some virtues too, is that. Um, those of us who think dynamically think about things like transference and counter-transference and some of the, the, oops, some of the complicated things that can occur uh, in, in any, particularly in any intense human relationship. And um, uh, actually, uh, there's a, a psychiatrist named Stephen Burglass uh, who published an article in the Harvard Business a couple of decades ago called The Very Real Dangers of Executive Coaching. And, the, and one of the dangers that he highlights, maybe the main one, is that you know, what happens when the soccer coach is encountering an intense transference reaction? Um, I'm not sure they're quite equipped to, to handle that. Um, but, but what's fascinating about the executive coaching movement, um, and a movement is maybe as, as good a way to describe it as anything, is that um, uh, it, it, it has, has destigmatized the need for help. And whereas in its early days, it was used for executives who were in trouble, you know, who were, they may have been high performers in some ways, but were bad managers or uh, uh, difficult people to get along with, and they would get coaching to help them with that. Now, uh, everyone wants one. And um, uh, some of the, uh, the, the startups that I work with the, the venture capitalists who fund them won't fund uh, a, a company unless the CEO has an executive coach. So it, it's really gone 180 degrees in the opposite direction. And I think that's ultimately a good thing um, because it acknowledges the essential loneliness and, and the need to talk that uh, the people in these high-pressured senior roles have. So I don't call myself an executive coach. I'm sure I've been called worse things, um, but, um, but it's, it's related. I also tend to focus more on the organization as client with the CEO as the primary person that I'm interacting with, and coaching is more often just a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Another, I think there was another question. Hi. Uh, 
If um, you were lucky or maybe unlucky enough to receive a call from the White House and somebody said to you, I've got a huge, huge problem, <laughs> would you come in and um, see if you could help me a little bit with this? How would you approach it? Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I, I suspect in our, in, in, in our fantasies, all of us may have entertained that. Uh, that, that fantasy, you know, if I got that call, it would be hard to turn it down. Um, I, I think the likelihood of my getting that call are nil. Um, so I'm not holding my breath. Um, and, 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 I, and in part because um, the, uh, the, the people who do call me um, are, are, are a somewhat self-selecting bunch and they're, uh, it's, it's, it's not as though some degree of narcissism excludes people from becoming CEOs or leaders of, of, of organizations. In fact, it may be necessary. And, uh, and so there, there are varying degrees of, 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 of narcissism in all the clients that I work with. But, um, but, there's, but the people who call me also have some self-awareness. They have some openness to the idea that they don't have all the answers. They don't have that kind of pathological certainty that our president seems to have. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so I think it's unlikely that he would, he would seek advice. Um, I would certainly go talk to him. It's interesting, I, I actually have, uh, have two clients who are on Trump's uh, strategy and policy advisory council. And so, um, so I talk to them quite a bit about their fleeting interactions with the president, and they really are fleeting. Um, he doesn't really utilize that council as a source of advice. It's more a, a list of you know, sort of impressive looking names. Um, but he, he doesn't seem to seek advice from, from just about anyone. He's, not, he's, he's rather paranoid. He doesn't trust people. If I went there, I would certainly want to talk to him and listen, and uh, uh, I, I wouldn't want to try to do anything too fast because that would be the surest way to be tossed out. Um, but whether or not he has the capacity to form any kind of meaningful relationship um, of the kind that, that I try to get involved in with my clients, I, I, I'm, I'm really doubtful of. So with regard to Giuliani, you know, he, people who worked with him knew him as quite impetu tempestuous. Uh, and I always wondered what the effect on him becoming unhinged was when he lost his followers and had uh, you know, transrectal uh, placement of radioactive seeds and the whole business of having uh, serious prostate cancer. But I wanted to ask you if I could about Assad, who was an ophthalmologist, because his uh, older brother was the heir apparent. Yep. Uh, and he was an ophthalmologist practicing in London and had a uh, Palestinian model wife uh, who seemed to be non-political uh, and now has become the great gasser. Hmm. Any thoughts about Assad? You know, first of all, you just in, in your question, it's clear that you know more about Assad than I do, and so I, I'd actually be interested in hearing, hearing your thoughts about it. The fact that, um, that he's an ophthalmologist is appalling. Um, uh, and, and where, I, where I'm, when I'm wearing my other hat in my uh, human rights work with, with PHR, uh, Syria has been a, a major focus of our work because of his attacks on medical professionals, on hospitals and doctors. And 90% uh, of the doctors in, in Syria are no longer in Syria. They've either fled the country as refugees or they've been actively targeted by the Assad regime because they're on the front lines not only of treating the victims but of gathering evidence of the war crimes, including this recent episode of uh, you know, use of sarin gas. Um, what, the, the, what, if I can answer your question in a somewhat different way, I know we're about to run out of time here. Um, your, your question implicitly um, evokes what might, in, in the minds of some, be questions about the Goldwater Rule, about the idea of, you know, of making speculations about the, um, the, the, the psyche of a, of a leader, somebody at a distance, you know, who I clearly will never examine uh, directly, at least I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> and I think that this is where the dynamic perspective I, I find helpful, because I think the idea of coming up with a diagnosis, frankly, I don't even find that a particularly interesting question, much less a useful one. And, um, but I think that, that a lot can be said, albeit in a speculative way, based on the kind of biographical um, data that you're citing. Um, some of you may, may know the work of Jerry Post, who I've become friends with over the years. He's a psychiatrist, now retired, and uh, emeritus professor at uh, George Washington, who was the founder of the psychological section of the CIA. And his job was to, to develop psychological profiles of rural leaders. That's actually how I met him. We, we were both uh, commenting on Saddam Hussein, uh, quoted in an article in the New York Times a number of years ago, around the time that they 
pulled him out of the hole in the ground. Um, and Jerry uh, ran afoul of the American Psychiatric Association, even though he was doing what certainly he thought, and I would agree, was patriotic work, pre presenting, preparing dossiers on world leaders, whether it's people who were enemies of the country or just world leaders who um, our presidents were going to have a meeting with and who wanted, they wanted to have some understanding of how, how to relate to them. So your question touches on that, uh, that controversy, which has been in the news a lot recently. Well, just to protect Jerry, he didn't, that's not where he ran afoul. He ran afoul uh, not from his classified work, but from talking about it publicly. Right, right, right. Wearing your human rights hat for the moment as your principal hat, what should we do about the situation in Syria? I, I wish I knew. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm disturbed by, by Trump's, at least his earlier comments about uh, not thinking that regime change was necessary. He seems to have changed his mind based on these photographs of dead children. Um, but I do think re regime change there is necessary. The influence of the United States is, while clearly significant, is limited. Um, my sense is that the Russians are more, more in control of that situation right now than we are. Um, but um, but I think a combination of, uh, you know, it's easy for me to say and hard to do, but regime change plus what we're often not so good at, which is thinking about what happens after regime change, because we're, 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 we, we do a fair job sometimes of getting rid of bad leaders, but we don't do a good job of filling the leadership vacuum that remains. Um, that's not a very satisfying answer to your question, because I don't think I have a, a good answer to that. I've noticed it's one, so we should say thank you.